Dire Wave. Three. Our anthropology is not derived by human psychology or you know empirical data from MIT or something like this. It's derived from the revealed aspect of, of what we see in Christology. And so there's no real way to diagnose man's problem and to understand man and man's anthropology, as I said, without the, the right theology. Logos is the icon of the Father, and man is the icon of God. We are the image of God. Dire Wave 3. Three. Yo, yo, what's up? We got... Uh... Jamie and her spy garb here, cloaked over here. All spies wear glasses. She cloaked. I'm in one of my aliases. Um, is this a wine mom alias? Where's your Virginia <laughs> Slim? <laughs> yeah. Your box wine. Yeah, it's my Western girl. I just meant those sunglasses. Oh. The sunglasses look like a wine mom. Yeah. Or a 2000 spy. Right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you're right yeah. because. <clears throat> the sunglasses actually feature pretty prominently in this film. Both uh, Sloane's sunglasses and Sydney's sunglasses. Yes. I don't know why, but for some reason, Sydney always plays a rave person. Like, she's always going into raves. Two-thirds of her contacts are at some a nightclub rave. <laughs> at a rave. rave. And she, yeah. under, she goes in as this, like, rave chick from the early 2000s. So yep. half of her personas or that so <clears throat> i don't know 
if you guys know, but yes, uh, we did. We went back and we watched Alias, and I know probably a lot of people are thinking, who cares about the first J.J. Abrams show? Nobody cares about Alias. Well, if you recall, if you're old school Jay's Analysis followers, you know that I did an Alias essay analysis 10 years ago. So it's kind of like a 10-year reunion, in a way, for the old school Jay's Analysis followers for me to redo Alias. And this time we got this beautiful chick to watch it with me. So it was her first time. She'd never seen it. She didn't want to do it. She was like, that looks dumb. Right? It did look dumb. And I was like, it no, was I promise crazy. you. Well, in ways it's dumb. Alias but, was our nighttime bedtime show. So there's certain shows you want to watch. You can watch before you fall asleep. And yeah, this it's not is like the. Let's, you. You know, we'll, we'll watch <laughs> yeah. this as we're going to bed. Yeah. Type of thing. It's not going to hurt you. Yeah. Well, like, you know, innocent things like. I want to watch Human Centipede before I go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. We'll watch Psych or yeah. um, X Files or something, yeah. you know, peaceful like that. Now, this is. So, why is this relevant? Well, I didn't really think it was going to be that relevant for a show. I thought, well, uh, you know we'll have fun with it watching it at night. But then I was like, man, I'm going to, as soon as, after about three episodes, I'm like, like, we're going to have to take notes on this because this is so crazy. Yeah. And a lot of people, I know this is not going to get a lot of views. Not many people are into this, but uh, this is not the first TV series. We've done uh, Buffy. We did X-Files. Have we done any other series? Have we done Psych? We've done Black Mirror. Not really. That's a series. Yeah, we True did, Detective is a series. Yeah, we did. Uh, I've done True Detective. So um, we've done several TV shows. It's always a challenge to do podcasts or uh, shows on a show. So I don't really know how to tackle it other than to just dive into the notes that I took. Because I took a lot of notes, man. I took 10 pages of notes. He, he took notes and I fell asleep. So I, but you liked it. it I did boring. like it. So like every night we'd put it on, and so you know, like three quarters of the way, I'm asleep, and I have to ask him the next day what happened at the end. So if you would hit like and share, all the chat is uh, saying that they're glad you're back. They've missed you. Yeah, it's been been a few weeks since Jamie did a stream with me because she got the AIDS like me, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> she yeah. got viral uh, airborne AIDS like everybody. That was else not did. fun. We did a movie show a couple weeks ago. What was it? What did we do? Uh, Hey, I talked for five hours today, but I'm still here with y'all. I was sick. And that's the chalk power. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. You were sick when I made you do that movie stream. That was on Rockfin. Oh, okay. And we did Mommy Dearest. Oh, yeah. Three Faces of Eve. Weird old movie. Motorama, which was cool. Yeah. And I forget the other one. But that's over on Rockfin if you want to see that, guys. Uh (laughs) This will probably have a part two, but I know a lot of people don't really care about this show, but why should you care about this show? Well, I'll just say this is that remember the Americans. That's another show we did analysis of. Americans is one of the best. Sopranos. Sopranos. Exactly. Americans is one of the best shows ever like Sopranos and Alias is like a more cartoon version of the Americans. So if you like the Americans, yeah. And if you want something in between the seriousness of the Americans and the silliness of Buffy. Buffy yeah. The middle ground that is uh, cartoonish and yet at the same time almost kind of realistic is what you get in Alias. Alias is funny because the contrast of Jennifer Garner's personality and having to be a spy, but she's also works for the CIA in real life. You, she's done training mm-hmm. videos and recruitment videos and Ben Affleck openly talks about he works with the CIA yep. for Argo so these guys are you know stamped by the uh, agencies for propaganda just like say um, like John Krasinski or mm-hmm. um, Clooney those, Angelina yeah. Jolie yeah uh, you know many of the the, the globalist minded Hollywood people that are pretty open about it you know it's pretty clear that they consult with and at, at different levels presumably work for the CIA. What were we just reading where the um, Air Force was approving a script about something? Stargate. Oh, okay. <clears throat> the Air Force would uh, edit uh, the Stargate scripts. And so shout out to um, Buddy over on Twitter that sent me that. Uh, 
because that yeah that's relevant i mean that just kind of indicates everything we've talked about and with alias um this was one of the early first shows where the trisha jenkins book mentions the fact that the cia was consulting jj abrams on this show so they they totally were you know making this in accord with the cia we know that as jamie said she as in garner goes to work in propaganda basically for the cia after this and presumably that would have some connection to this is right around the time that it became uh did they have a name as a celebrity couple benifer benifer this is the origins Benifer two <laughs> this is the origins of benifer because benifer one was j-lo and him and then benifer two was Jennifer Garner, who seems like such a sweet person. <laughs> I mean, she's so sunny to be a spy, but she goes through it in this series. And mm. uh, just like Buffy, they're <clears throat> always taking away her happiness and killing people she loves. Well, the first episode it is like starts Buffy. with <clears throat> they kill like her fiancé. <clears throat> oh, my gosh. Right. Yeah, so the way this kicks off is that, uh, of course, Jennifer Garner plays the college girl recruited into... What she thinks is the CIA, but it's actually a false flag recruitment. So if you didn't know that's a real thing, this actually exists where one agency will disguise themselves as somebody else and recruit unwitting dupes, know-nothings into a criminal organization or a false flag organization. And the people in it never know that they're working for this other elite group. So in that, here we have that setting where the show begins with a false flag recruitment uh, Sydney, the Jennifer Garner character, thinks that she's recruited for, to work for the CIA out of college. And all of that is, uh, I mean, typically this doesn't really happen, but it's, these are th real things that happen, but not all at once to one person, right? I mean, she's like, immediately goes from college to like, every week she's assassinating somebody else in some other country, right? Which is just crazy. Yeah. Well, the way this sh show bounces from city to city is crazy. I mean, they'll go to four different global geographic locations in one yeah. episode to track down and the the story arc is really fun yeah uh, so sydney's dad is her handler kind of she kind of has two handlers right so her, her dad is kind of a handler who is this long time v, uh you know vietnam vet cia operative jack and then the the villain of the show is arvin sloan who is also kind of her other handler pseudo dad figure who runs SD6, which is the false flag recruitment black ops thing, criminal organization that she works for. And so they immediately send her out, right, on assassination missions and all kinds of crazy uh, get the microchip yes. type operations. You, always, you have to get the chip or the, disc. the serum. In the early, late 90s, early 2000s, it's discs yeah. too. Um, you have to get the serum, the discs. The silver the briefcase with the foam inside with the artifact in it. The uh, Or the nukes. Yeah. There's always some nuke floating somewhere. Some compartment of a nuke. <laughs> there Or schematics. Lots of schematics. The schematics are always out there floating around. Yeah. Lots of schematics. The are lists track down. of people. Uh, the spies. Uh -huh. So there's lists of the spies that is floating around. you got to get back. Right? Yeah. Spies are always after the same 10 things. That's it. There's no <laughs> other things they're after. They're, they don't go after... Uh, what? Drugs. Spanish doubloons, right? Yeah. They don't go after. Yeah, they're not after drugs. They. Um, they need the microchip. Yeah, they're after the freaking discs and chips. Yeah. So. All right. So we're. So this is. When does Rambaldi come in? Is this start? So not. We don't really know about Rambaldi right away. We'll get to that in a minute because okay. that will bring in secret society elements and overall the story's finale. Uh, it's only five seasons, so if you're looking for an easy to watch show, this one's not too bad. It's and entertaining. It's fun because it's what, like 2000 to 2005 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's so 2000 to 2005. Yeah. It reminds you of college days when you were recruited by the fake CIA. <laughs> the other thing I liked about the initial setup was that she works for a front company that actually sounds like it could be a real intelligence front or cutout. All right? She works for Credit Dauphine, which is a fake bank. Now, how many fake banks have intelligence agencies? Many. Okay, there have been yeah. many of these. The BCCI is one of the most famous examples of CIA cutout bank. Um, and many other banks have served, you know, the Nugent Hand Bank. Many banks, intelligence connect that have 
served in this capacity. And so Credit Dolphin is a perfect example of this. And this was started by this um, enigmatic French character that we learn is the main dude of the first villain group that's the first two seasons. So the first two seasons focus on the um, special directive uh, group that is a subset of the Alliance. And we don't know who the Alliance is, but it was started by this French character, which immediately kind of gives us the Illuminati, right? French kind of um, Illuminous vibes. We, we, we don't know much about this guy, but long story short, it's an alliance of criminal syndicates of underworld figures who used to be in intelligence. So it's a private shadow, deep politics government that is non-national. It's an international clique like Spectre, which always comes up in every spy. Every spy movie or TV show or series has the syndicate, Spectre, Smirsh, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and the bad guys need the codes. <laughs> they, <laughs> they always need the um, codes to the bank account, and the hackers got to get the bank account so they can transfer mm-hmm. the funds. Well, another thing too, so like y'all, we were talking about her style and whatnot. Mm-hmm. This is late. So the in, the 90s just ended. And the 90s ended with a lot of those hacker movies. So cyberpunk hacker crap was still in vogue in the early 2000s. And that's why at the beginning, half of the missions she's doing is she's going to raves. Well, and she's in because rave culture overlaps with hacker yes. cyberpunk culture. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I had forgotten this until we watched Hackers. Yeah. And you have the number one hacker of the world, Marshall, who can hack anything and everything from anywhere. Right. You think so, this sounds terrible because the characters are such like tropes. archetypes and yeah. tropes, but it's actually an entertaining, right? So <laughs> Marshall is the ultimate tech guru he's the q from james bond he's the updated q who's just a nerdy dude and he's a spurg right but this is kind of pre-spurg era Mm because it's 2000 right but you'll notice marshall has all these references to things that were way ahead of their time like he references stuff in regard to like the internet that we all now think about as like commonplace that nobody knew about back then i mean even the show's references to the NSA were way ahead of time, mm, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, even though uh, NSA started to be spoken of a little more in early 2000s when Bamford started having more books come out, 2004, 2005, 2007, um, and I can think of two Bamford books that came out during that time period. Um, it's still, in, two, in the year 2000, especially prior to 9-11, people didn't talk about or know what NSA meant, right? It was just kind of like, what what is it? but in this show it comes up a lot and in fact the show will have some very interesting statements in the 2001 and 2 season because of the big nine event in fact the show will mention the echelon spying mm-hmm. scandals and, and they use that yeah that shows them how they use that echelon yeah they actually use echelon in the show multiple times and this is prior to uh the stuff that snowden talked about Right. So this is like, because I was watching Lord Voldemort back in 2003. That's when I started watching him. And I, so I first heard about a lot of this stuff from him and another couple books I'd read in the year 2000 that talked about the NSA and the spying surveillance tech. And so I'm going back and watching this show now, especially in seasons one and two, you're going to be like, whoa, dude, how are they talking about all of this like super high level surveillance stuff? Total information awareness, echelon stuff, pre Snowden. Mm, mm-hmm. This is 10 years before Snowden stuff. Mm, good point. Um, hyper concept mentalization. Hyper compartmentalization oh, allows for SD6 to think that they're the CIA. So, in other words, the, the, the notion of compartmentalization comes up in Alias because the only way that something like uh, false flag recruitment would work is given the fact that like the military espionage stuff is classified, right? Like you have to have a higher level clearance to get access to what's really going on. So the people that do the operations that are field trained, they know about their mission. 
They don't know what the people at the Brzezinski and Kissinger level are deciding because mm-hmm. they're not they're not qualified for that level of clearance. Mm. So, an example of how this works is that false flag recruitment wouldn't even work would be possible unless there was high level compartmentalization. So I was just taking notes about the things that I you know was noticing as we were watching mm-hmm. going through the series, but. Uh- it mentions the Red Cross as a CIA cover, which surprised me. I didn't expect that. That was right away in the first few episodes. Um, as with always, we have the anti-Russian propaganda. Always in U.S. spy TV shows, Russians are always the villains. Um, every now and then, to be fair, though, they will put a uh, supranational or CIA person as the villain. And they kind of do that in this show some, to be fair. So I, I was a little... I mean, there's, there's a lot of anti-Russian episodes, but ultimately it wasn't as bad as I expected because the villains here are pretty close to kind of the way the world really works, mm-hmm. right? With, with the villains, the, the one, well, one criticism I have of the show is that the ultimate bad guys are kind of like organizations that fall apart and then get started over. And I don't think the real global elite are like constantly re- restarting their system. I think that there's a consistent pattern of elite. That's my only criticism. But other than that, it's pretty revelatory. Yeah. Uh, I like how all season one, you think she thinks she's working for the good guys. Mm-hmm. And then she finds out that, like you said, it's all a counter uh, organization. And. <clears throat> she has to go to work for the actual CIA yeah, and yeah. then she's doing two missions at once yeah. so she's got two different like handlers two different contacts and she's have to double cross one and the other and... yeah this was all like over the top and cartoonish mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. totally unrealistic but it's weird because the things that are coming up in the show are real things but they're not all combined into one person doing all this crazy stuff mm-hmm. right um Let's see. So as we progress through season one, we're getting to... So by episode five, you have the mention of uh, IG Farben and their support for uh, a certain party in Germany. You have the notion of um, inhalable vaccinations, which is odd given things that have happened recently, which I'd never heard of that until recently. Um, We have the notion of a fake defector. Um, Fake defections are real things. That's where a person defects uh, under the cover of being a authentic defector but they're doing it to get in deep into the enemy's you know uh operations to send information back as a fake defector so that comes up in a few episodes um there's extractions fake extractions covers fake deaths come up which is fascinating she never knows if her father's working for her or against her yeah, so the first season um, is all about trust because yeah. she can't trust either her dad or Sloan because she, again, we know she ends up working for Sloan's running the bad organization as a fake cutout. Mm-hmm. And then her mother gets brought in, who's a double agent as well, never knowing who her um, loyalty is to. So she's got all these people around her that are also <laughs> double, triple, whatever people. Yeah, I think the um, on the one hand, it's enjoyable to have the constant displacement of knowing who to trust in a spy show. Mm-hmm. But in this one, it's like so constant that it keeps changing. It's almost cartoonish. So again, it's almost like a, a cartoonish approach to spy shows. But again, it's still like kind of real. Yeah. Um, for example, and let me get this. Go ahead. What? Oh, I was just going to say, so it starts to shape up into a little family and yeah. you'll learn throughout the show that a lot of family members um, are well, she also comes, spies. Yeah, she comes from a spy family and a lot of times it is family. Yeah. It is a blood. Exactly. Uh, so she, she had an MK Ultra upbringing in pro- something called yes. Project Christmas. Yes. And that's, so that was my next note was that uh, by episode six, we begin to see... Um, MK Ultra elements coming in, which are going to play heavy throughout the show. It's even going to be referenced in the show explicitly. And we have the notion of the hypnotic courier, where uh, a certain guy, Shepard, is con- um, an MK Ultra program person who then uh, reveal information. I can't barely read my notes. 
oh, there's a John Donne poem that is his trigger code to bring out the uh, storage secret trigger, inf the, the hidden information in one of his altars. And so she goes to like some, I don't know, like Polish mental institute prison to oh, meet yeah. with the guy who's the hypnotic courier assassin. And she, because she's an English student in grad school, that's her cover is that she's finishing her grad school as an English major. And so she knows the John Donne poem that triggers the, the hidden information and in this like psycho assassin guy's ultimate personality. Mm -hmm. So within six episodes, we're like, we're already into, you know, in culture ta ta territory. Uh, what does that say? Re. Oh, recharging. That's the. Um, Reckoning. Reckoning. That's the name of the episode. And so we find out that the assassin is actually an MK Ultra uh, Irish, like an IRA assassin. Um, then it brings in even more sophisticated elements because we find out there's this other faction called K Directorate. And K Directorate is a bunch of KGB people. And so then the, so the K, former KGB are fighting the CIA, fighting the Alliance, which is the International Secret Illuminati Syndicate. And this is all going to shift as the show progresses. But this reminds us again of the Americans and the shows that we did with Mark about the director at S, Illegals Program. Mm -hmm. And come to find out, Sydney's mom is an illegal. So she was brought over to the U.S. to marry Jack as a deep cover sleeper KGB person. Like the Americans. Like the Americans, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that is, was a real KGB program called Director S, the Illegals Program, as we've done multiple shows with Mark Hackett. Well, there was a, wasn't there an episode in the later seasons where they went to Russia to a American yes. neighborhood? Yes. And so I even speculated, I bet the creators of the Americans had watched this episode. They might have even had similar consultants. I don't remember the name of the guy who consulted on the Americans, but it might have been the same people that consulted on the show because there's an episode in the later seasons, yes, where Sydney and Vaughn, who's her love interest um, as the show progresses, they, they infiltrate a former KGB illegals program, which is just reconstituted, where they have a complete fake American suburb. And they're teaching the, the operatives how to do American things, how to live in American culture, how to go buy a car, how to, you know, debate people about the price and all this kind of stuff, right? And that was a real thing that they really had these kind of fake cities where they would train their KGB illegals to come become Americans. And we find out that's what happened to Sydney's mom. Mm -hmm. So Sydney is the product of the two polar dialectic offices of the Cold War. Right. Plus World War II's tactics. MK Ultra. Yeah. So in other words, and, and this will be clear in the show, they add in this quasi Da Vinci code element, which is really cheesy. So this is where we Milo start. Rimbaldi. This is where we start to get the, the Rimbaldi artifacts. And on one level, I think they threw this in <laughs> just because this is when Da Vinci code was getting popular. So Rimbaldi is like all the Ninja Turtles plus Leonardo Da Vinci plus Nikola Tesla plus Nostradamus. Did I leave anybody out? Nostradamus, Tesla. <laughs> Isaac Newton. New yeah, he's like this, in, this perfect figure of the Renaissance Hermeticist that yeah. knows all the secrets. So and what's this thing here? He's got a lot going on that people want to get in on his technology. So it's got it's kind of national treasure like too in that. Or like uh, Indiana Jones, they're always looking for artifacts of Rinbaldi to put together to make some devices. Well, the key, the, there was a clue already with John <clears throat> Dunn because he was Elizabethan uh, alchemist. Or his his poetry is full of alchemy, which is was popular in the Elizabethan period. I had to write a bunch of grab papers on that. That's how I know about it. So they, whoever was writing the show was, you know, fairly clever in these allusions and references. And as they introduce, this is where it gets really silly. Okay. So they introduce the secrets of Rambaldi, which are, again, are these bizarre, unclear artifacts, which is like a clock and a music box and a knife, all this just dumb shit, right? That doesn't make any sense, but somehow it all fits together to be a code for the secrets of nature. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, 
kind of real in that the Renaissance Hermeticist people, you know, Leonardo da Vinci and, and Michelangelo, they, they kind of did think this way, but there's not one giant code of a bunch of like artifacts and MacGuffins that you put, that you put together <laughs> into a device that's going to give you the secrets of the universe. So that's but, where it gets but really it was silly. Like stuff like free energy stuff and like, yeah. you can make a bubble, like a giant water bubble for some reason. Um, one, well, that was part of like the cold fusion. There was the Rimbaldi juice that triggers your memories mm-hmm. so you can write out secrets of the alchemists. And right. It was a wild ride. Right. So on the one on one on the one hand, it's true that the Renaissance Hermeticists were all fascinated, obsessed with this stuff. But there's no one dude who like figured out all the mysteries of nature and could achieve immortality and free energy. <laughs> and that's where the show goes. Spoiler alert, which is really dumb, but it's kind of real. And Sydney's like a moon child, like a uh, chosen one. Yeah, this is the again the stupidest element is that they included Sydney in the prophecies of Rimbaldi, which is dumb and makes no sense. But part of Rimbaldi's secrets were the discovery of DNA, and the DNA lists the one who will like save the world or whatever, which of course ends up being Sydney. Mm-hmm. Now that's dumb, but at the same time, <laughs> it's like there's kind of an element of truth to this with the way the Renaissance Hermeticists thought. Yeah. So. Uh, go ahead i just remembered if you're done talking about rimbaldi for a second yeah that's the essence of rimbaldi um you've got cradley booper in season one he's a journalist and then that shows you how the cia works with journalists oh that was another interesting element right uh right away bradley cooper's character is this goober journalist who thinks he's going to win sydney over by solving the murder of her uh fiance and she keeps telling him not to pursue it because she doesn't want him to stumble onto what she really does because that would result in him being killed. It's funny that she um, does all these missions and like gets the crap kicked out of her and gets in all these fights and then she has to come home and like just go to someone's birthday party or eat ice cream on the couch like a normal girl. Yeah, really cartoonish, right? Yeah. Yeah, you just assassinate three just, people. Uh, and okay, you, let me take a bath. Then she had time to play Monopoly with, with Monopoly with her roommate. Yeah. Um, this was another interesting point I noticed pretty early on. We're almost done with season one, but um, so you can be a double agent. You fight for the CIA and versus the bad guys and assassinate people at the same time, and you uh, infiltrate operations in various countries each week, and she has to be uh, writing her graduate papers. So I can tell you from experience, writing graduate papers, that you could not do these things at the same time. (laughs) And try and be a normal girl to keep your cover. It's it's ludicrous, but at the same time, it's 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 almost like like a comic book, right? What a lot of these um, shows in that era had the um, teenage girl heroine, Dark Angel. Exactly, Dark Angel, Dollhouse, yeah, Dollhouse. Exactly. This is so they, so they were already yeah making these like super women double lives, um, kind of mm-hmm. popular, right? Yes, and Sydney is kind of the ultimate double because there's a point where she will actually be mind controlled to have alters, and she won't remember two years of her life. That occurs, I think, in season two or three, which is pretty wild because, um. The Sydney character is very, even in such a goofy show, she's damaged. Like she's, she eventually becomes very damaged and upset, hurt. Early on, like you said, she's cheery and happy in season one and two, even when she's going and killing people. Mm -hmm. And by season five, I mean, she's been betrayed by so many people and her mom ends up being this complete villain that, I mean, she's a very damaged person. Yeah. Her psyche is damaged. She's it's traumatized. With she's everybody. traumatized. Yes. Um, and like you said, there's a, a part where she's missing for two years and her uh, love interest marries someone else. And she was being used by the criminal syndicate for two years as an assassin. Right. And she didn't. She has this other personality called Julia Thorne, who's a British chick, <laughs> right, that she doesn't remember any of. And eventually things trigger her memory when she's lost. But... Um, uh, side note, if you're a fan of like horror and whatnot, Angus Scrim 
is a, a bit part character that pops up as the evil mind control brainwasher handler <laughs> assassin programmer for SD6 in season one. Um, the interesting element I noticed right away was that Rambaldi's symbol is an all seeing eye. So they kind of like lay that one out <laughs> for really, really quick for it you. It also looks like it could come from a computer like keyboard because it's just a greater than. Oh, and that's a, zero a good point. It's like than. a zero with two greater thans. Yeah. So. Good point. Um, a lot of references to Renaissance magic, Neoplatonism, and Medici uh, under, undergird this. They have um, both CIA and SD6 run hospitals. I thought that was fascinating that actually hospitals are covers for various intelligence agencies. And people can be disappeared, organs can be harvested, and people can be assassinated in these fake hospitals, cut out hospitals. Now they're real hospitals, but they're just run by some deep politics, deep state operative. Um, some hospitals are run by K-Directorate, which was the K former KGB, some by SD6. And we eventually hear about uh, the Alliance by the end of season one, that it was run out of Paris, France, hence the Illuminous connection I mentioned. And SD6 was one of the Alliance's special directorates for assassinations and black ops. And the bank, the fake bank, was a French... I mentioned that. Oh, okay, credit yeah. Credit Dauphine. Yeah. Yeah, that's why the French guy who founded the Alliance had as his fa fake cover bank, Credit Dauphine. Uh, what does this say? Something gain control through... Uh, oh, it's when they explain this secret elite group, they say that the, the Alliance eventually con contained or gained control through their knowledge of espionage and crime syndicates. So in other words, linking the techniques and strategies of intelligence agencies with that of crime syndicates, which they're basically the same thing. They're interlocking. Um what does it say Egyptian arms dealer gets what face change and gets us oh then they start introducing these notions of plastic surgery oh. which is believable like face, face off, off right yeah. so we got Nick Nicholas K not face off is not believable but I'm saying like facial alteration occurs if people need to take on a new identity right but yeah like full body that that. Well, that's when it gets dumb is because then it turns into not just facial reconstruction. DNA. But damage. like you get in this machine that <laughs> it alters your DNA so yeah. your body can look like someone else. Yeah. And that's one of the Rimbaldi secrets, which is really dumb. But yeah. Um, what does this say? No idea. Cuba. Something. Big nine event era. Right after, yeah. So then it, <clears throat> we notice that there's a, a transition to, from season one to season two is right after 9-11. So the big nine event, which actually comes up a few times in the show. Um, the, let's see, they speculate about Jack being KGB. That was no big deal. Then we find out, yes, yeah, so then they reveal that Sydney, as you said, was an indigo moon child super spy who was groomed to be a super soldier and the uber woman, mm -hmm. the uber chick, not the uber mensch, but the uber chick, because she was put into Project Christmas by her father who noticed her exceptional abilities. So yeah. it actually is a uh, super soldier program and it begins with kids and they have these all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. And... They named it the Covenant. No, the Covenant is a secret society group that is dedicated to Rambaldi. So uh, we're not yet done with SD Six and the Alliance, but by the end of season two, the they take down the Alliance. So eventually, they get rid of it. But we need a new villain, and so the villain ends up being this new secret society group that includes some of the Alliance people. That is dedicated to solving the mysteries of Rambaldi. Mm. And that will be the Covenant. And the Covenant follows Rambaldi's New World Order plan. And then it starts to reference these kind of bizarre, almost Rosicrucian elements, right? So then other ideas about mass depop are mentioned because part of the Rambaldi plan is the cleansing of the world of the overpopulation and the unrighteous. And the Covenant is largely a bunch of KGB people who are interested in secret society stuff, which mm. is just interesting. So 
Rimbaldi had a psychic vision of the truth, which led to uh, his prediction of Sydney. It's literally Da Vinci Code level BS. Um, she is in part the technology because she's a super soldier. Um, think about Resident Evil, how they take the Mila Jovovich character and make her the cloned new Eve character who's going to be the pattern for the new humanity. They're basically doing the same thing here, where Sydney is a child prodigy of the alchemical process, and thus she's the product of the uh, East-West Cold War dialectic. Mm -hmm. Right, Her mom is the super soldier of the KGB. Her dad is this super K uh, CIA Cold War operative. Um, what does that say? Roger. Roger Moore. Moore. Oh, this shows Roger Moore shows up. Yeah. So there's all these. Guest stars. And Tarantino. Remember? Yeah. So. Angus Scrim, Tarantino. Angus. Roger Moore, right. Who else? Uh. Well, it's what's his name that tries to act like Jack Nicholson all the time every time he talks. Christian Slater. <laughs> Christian Slater, little Jack, little Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Uh, pops up as a NSA codebreaker guy. Mm -hmm. um, Quentin Tarantino pops up as a guest villain for about three episodes, which actually is entertaining. He's actually a funny villain because he's part of the Covenant, and he comes in to torture with hot needles. You know what the hot needles are? You know what hot needles are? You don't want to know what hot needles are. But I'm going to show you hot needles. He's got little hot needles which have hot sauce. Oh, that's Remember? right. They poke like, you. Do you know what hot sauce does? <laughs> <a needle?" laughs> right? Yeah. And he pokes Sloan to get the information yes. out of him. Yes, he had Piri Piri and ghost pepper. pepper. Yeah, he had good freaking ghost peppers and jalapenos on there. Yep. But uh, he also like karate beats up Sydney. He's the only guy in the whole show who can out karate Sydney, which was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Like, just think of Quentin Tarantino, like, doing karate. I don't know. No one else can beat Sydney, not even Vaughn. But Quentin Tarantino beats her ass, right? Yeah. Uh, there was something else I was going to say about the... Oh, so Roger Moore pops up, ironically, which is kind of funny because Roger Moore being Bond was supposed to be, right, the good guy. And here his guest role is as one of the leaders of the Illuminati. <laughs> so mm. he's one of the, uh, the Alliance. Um, then we find about, about the prophecy. This is really dumb for that season. Um, NSA is launches an occult investigation unit for intelligence that includes remote viewing and other. So they actually reference a special unit of the NSA tasked with studying the occult which references uh, or makes us think of, you know, men who st uh, stare at goats and the Project Stargate, SRI, remote viewing. Remote viewing is actually mentioned. They have remote viewing, people that were successful at it. Um, they bring in the John Locke character. It's not John Locke, oh, but yeah. it's that dude. Um, uh, Quinn or whatever his name is. I forget yeah. the actor's real name, but <clears throat> he's always in J.D. Abrams stuff, right? He's always playing the same kind of character. And he's part of the secret uh, group that's studying Rimbaldi within the deep state, the American CIA deep state, <laughs> right? Um, they mention Pope Alexander. What does this say? I can barely read it. Evil Pope Medici or Sydney Med tells medieval evil. Sydney tells John Locke that not John Locke, but the I always call him John Locke because of Lost. Sydney tells that dude that Rimbaldi was the uh, no the true Nostradamus, and that. Um, it dates back to Pope Alexander the Sixth, so there's a reference to the like the worst pope in history, and then Russian mafia. What does this say? Mentioned many times. So then they start bringing in the Russian mafia. They start bringing in all these other elements, which are all you know real world elements. But uh, oddest thing in this season was that she's invited to a, a masquerade ball, which is literally like an eyes wide shut thing. So they have this like totally eyes wide shut. Remember that that mm -hmm. sequence where she's at that mass ball? It looks just like something from eyes wide shut. Mm -hmm. And then I put Tom Coom. I don't know why Tom Coom's not in this Russian embassy in Vienna. Oh, that's where they have the uh, eyes wide shut masquerade. Is that the Russian embassy? No, that's relevant. Uh, 
from K director. No, that's relevant. Blah blah blah. CIA. Ma oh, they mentioned the CIA mafia connection. That was the whole point of that. Why I want to bring it up? Which many times we've seen this. The CIA has co-opted or worked with uh, organized crime, Sicilian mafia, etc. Many times. Uh, oh, the Eyes Wide Shut uh, event was based not excuse me not in Russia. It was in Austria, and the reason that's relevant is that. The Austrian Illuminati is where we typically think of masquerade balls coming from, right? Hmm. Um, well, actually, they go back Venice. to the medieval Renaissance, mm -hmm. Venice, yeah. But the the excuse me, the Illuminati. I'm saying we think of Bavaria, right? Yeah. Um, alias is a goofier Americans. Exactly. That's when I started realizing, like, <laughs> this, this is just the Americans, but goofier. Uh, national treasure, right? Yeah. Like, the, the Rimbaldi stuff is literally just like National Treasure. That was a good analogy you made. Um, Alliance versus k -Dare. Oh, they mentioned the great work. So, the great work of Rimbaldi is the alchemical uh, trans transmuting nature, right? And cleansing the earth. And they say that it will then bring forth immortality. So, we begin, we start to get these... In, 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 these um, inklings of the overall plan being about achieving immortality so it's about transhumanism mm -hmm. i did not expect that in this show that's that surprised me what do you think yeah and the way it ended very um indiana jones adventure like where they're in the cave in don't spoil the end okay. for everybody because right. we might have to do that later oh okay but yeah so there will be a very uh Indiana Jonesy ending exactly. Um, so we get a we get an insight into other Rimbaldi secrets, as you said. It will be uh, battery, free energy, and immortality. <laughs> so uh, absolute um, absolute free energy, right? What is this about Bilderberg? Well, when we start to get an inkling into the workings of the Alliance, we see that. They, this is right before they become the covenant. We see they operate like Spectre. Mm -hmm. And so there's imagery that's very similar to something like Bilderberg, World Economic Forum. Um, organ harvesting comes up. That's one of the um, sources of income for this syndicate. Uh, we start to notice when, oh, this is when Sloan is being initiated into the full membership in the Alliance. And he has to kill somebody. And they have to kill, he has to kill his wife. Yeah. And they put the microchip in him. So this is interesting because secret societies typically ask you to make your bones. Mafias ask you to do this. And if you kill somebody, you show your dedication. And so in this situation, of course, Sloan is tasked with killing his wife because she's figured out that he works for this group. Um, so that was his initiation process. Uh, we find out that Sydney's mom has blackmailed people with her job was a P R O N prawn blackmailer. And she got a hold of powerful people sleeping with people. And that was this disc. That's another thing spies need to get is the blackmail. The porn disc. Stuff. Prawn disc. What does that say? Driving code nets. 007. No. <laughs> no, this is a movie. So, <laughs> see, it's like my, my I wrote this in Rombaldi script, right? <laughs> so we have to decode it. We dude. need to squirt some lemon juice on here <laughs> and get a UV light. Put it, put it in the put it in the oven. Can you, can you read this? Put this in the oven. Uh -huh. Don't show them the secret notes. Oh, okay. This is Rombaldi. They're they're profane. Are not allowed to see the, <laughs> the Rombaldi text. Um, it's something Da Vinci Code meets 007. Oh, That's yeah. That's what I said. And you were making these all at night in the dark. Correct. Almost falling That's asleep. That's why I can and never read say, it. Wait, I have to wake up and write this down. Just when I go into, like when we go to the movies and I have to write my notes really big in the dark in the movie theater and I can never tell what I wrote. Yeah. Um, we find out that Rambaldi was also a super spy. This actually brings to mind, um actual renaissance spies like paolo sarpi who was a renaissance spy uh, okay, we did that. and what's next 
So then we find out uh, the mom, all the stupid drama and manipulation with the mom. We could skip over all that. That's boring. That's not interesting. Well, it's just um, another um, person that Sydney's meant to trust that she can't trust. Right. It's her mom is always manipulating her. Who was the cons? Was this a character of Sydney's, or was it? It says conspiracy chick. So there's this girl who shows up. Who's like, I'm sort of a conspiracy theorist. I have a web page. It was somebody who was like meant to infiltrate and get. I think was it Bradley Cooper or somebody like that, uh, talking about things. No, it was a girl that says. It. I know she had. They had to go to the same AA meeting or something. Oh, that's right. Somebody was trying to get close to Bradley Cooper. And was, yeah. It was like, I have a conspiracy, blog, which is interesting because in 2003, three, four, there weren't very many conspiracy blogs. That's true. She doesn't call it a blog. She calls it a web page. <laughs> like, I have a GeoCities I ha- dedicated I have to conspiracy conspiracies. Web page. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, she's honey. a honey trap. Mm-hmm. That's right. She's a honey trap for Bradley Cooper. That's right. I remember that now. That was interesting. Uh, then we learn about KGB doing mind control experiments. It's always a KGB, but it actually also is the CIA too, because Project Christmas was a CIA program to train assassins. Um, what does that say first? First graders gate program for gifted. Oh, they mentioned that she's recruited in in first grade. So this is where we learn about Project Christmas. Child spies. And it's teaching children to be spies and assassins. Yeah. What does that say? Oh, so then since this is right after the Big Nine event, there's all this weird dialogue that starts coming into the show about violation of rights. The show also consistently has people doing T O R T U R E. Have you noticed that? Oh yeah. Sydney do you know they gets constantly that. do this? Even the electroshock. The good guys, the bad guys, everybody's doing T O R T U R E. And if you remember, right after the Big Nine event, uh, who was it? John Yu and all these people from the Bush administration were all trying to say, "Oh, we need to just do this now." Remember that? Mm-hmm. Remember how big of a debate. In and, 2001 and 2. Yeah, Guantanamo Bay yes, and all that. the T-O-R-T-U-R-E was. We have to use these tactics to get the information. Yes, uh, or else they're going to nuke a city, right? Yeah. Um. Then we get an interesting element that we have to be careful how we talk about this. We start to get the virus release scripts in the shows, which every spy show has the bad guy is going to release a bioweapon, right? Yeah, we know that. But this gets into genetically modified EBOLA, which is interesting. And this gets loose a few times. People are exposed to this. There's two or three episodes that deal with this bio, R-E-L-E-S-E, E-A-S-E. Get the nukes. Um, but they, oh, then they, then they talk about Season two, which takes place in 2002-2003, the Echelon program, and Echelon is mentioned because of the necessity of the Big Nine event. So we have to spy on everybody because of big the Big Nine. And the show actually makes mention to all of the backdoor NSA technology. It even mentions insider trading that people have access to on the part of corporate espionage through this backdoor technology. Everybody knows this is the Promis technology, which also is connected to the Big Nine event. Fascinating. So all of this like really obscure Big Nine event research stuff that not many people know about was in this t- mentioned in this TV show. Then guess what happens? Guess who gets recruited? Cradley. Cradley Booper himself. Once he gets too deep, he's in too deep. He has to get recruited into the CIA. <laughs> so he does this for about one season. Then he decides he can't hack it. Remember that? Yeah. Um, and and re- this is really a reference, I think, to something like Mockingbird, right? So Operation Mockingbird, we know from Woodward and Bernstein, revealed you know back in the day, decades ago, oh, the CIA has all these journalists they pay. Whoa, shocker, right? Like, of course, right? I mean, look at the media now. Okay, who doesn't know this now, right? Total vindication, way crazier than anything that Woodward and Bernstein thought. But it's mentioned in the show, right? The Bradley Cooper character is this kind of mockingbird person who then is tasked with 
his his journalism is dictated then by the CIA. Mm-hmm. One minute into the Echelon episode, there is a speech where Sidney tells Bradley Cooper that it is now necessary to fight the T-E-R-R-O-R that we do Echelon. And Bradley Cooper debates with her because he says this is not constitutional. Then we get into deep fakes. Yeah. Deep fakes come up, staged uh, fake implicating video information. Um, oh, remember when she <laughs> goes to talk to the Vietnamese generals and she turns on that device that knocks them all out? Oh, yeah. I liked her um, perfume that just puts you sleep. <laughs> or the lipstick that knocks you out. Right. Okay, so this show features the greatest spy of all time and the worst spy of all time simultaneously. Which are... Who's the greatest, Sydney? No, Jack. Oh, that's right. Jack's Jack, even better than Sydney. Yeah. You won't believe what Jack can get done in a day. If you wait around for part two, if you come over to the sh- the website and do part two, I will impersonate Jack for you. Okay. And the worst award goes to Badabahu. Dixon. Dixon, who gets his own wife killed accidentally kills someone's wife who was a nice lady uh gets his kids kidnapped is what? the worst he at is his literally cover. the worst has the worst aliases and the unbelievable like and gets promoted yeah somehow I mean, <laughs> the guy is terrible. he should have let quit when they found out that sd6 was um not a good group yeah but he no. couldn't quit dixon is i mean comedic at how bad he is which we'll talk more about that in the part two so we're almost about halfway um my mind is turning to mush because i've talked for so long uh i've talked for six hours straight and i can't think anymore and it's not fair to you guys. i think that was a Let's good stop part there. one and it was really yeah. fun and so we're gonna be peace out well we no you gotta read chats? the super chats okay let me so put my readers on. you get to read those start with funky d Jay, do you think going to work for a company like Raytheon would be inconsistent with serving God? As an Orthodox Christian, I'm leaving military because of the stabbies, but don't really have a job lined up. I would not do that. I mean, I'm not uh, the Lord of your conscience. I can't tell you infallibly what's wrong or right for you. Um, given that, that's a more nuanced question. It's not inherently wrong to work for companies or to work for uh, even the military. But if you if you do not agree with the goals of that institution, whether it's the government, whether it's a corporation whether it's a university, um, I would not. So that, but that's my take. Okay. Three green feathers, $10. Hey, Jay and Jamie. Hey, hey dude. what's up? Hey, remember to go over to chalk.com, support the show sponsor. I wish I could give a more energetic chalk ad. Um, if you want to be a super spy, get chalk.com, use the promo code J 50. My mind is mush, man. I can't, he um, did it all day today. Streamed all day. Only the chalk got me through. <laughs> Those uh, cacao beans give you Sydney superpowers. It makes you feel like you can... I didn't take those. I do take the other supplements. Yeah. But uh, you probably would like those more than me. That's not my... I can't really eat beans and stuff like that. No, I mean, it's more like nuts. I'll but... put it in like a fudge or something. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you guys. If you want to hear part two of this where we get into the uh, bigger secrets as to what this was really about, just a fun 